Please welcome Peggy Ostrowski. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming here. Um, let me just arrange this. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist and a university professor. And since 1992, I have been working in the neurobiology of violence. I have, been, uh, I have the privilege of being able to work, to have access to lots of criminal offenders, and uh, that includes members of the organized crime, uh, paid assassins, and serial killers. Uh, people think, they, the new PhDs who come to my lab, think that they, are they are getting into CSI Mexico. But in reality, what we are doing is to study the neuropsychology, neuroimaging, genetics, and the social upbringing, upbringing of very violent people. Uh, so, do you know that like, um, antisocial behavior can cause lots of damage? And it can come from minor offenses like cheating over friends to uh, paid assassins to robbing and killing. And you don't have to, you just have to listen to the news every day to see that violence is fairly common among human societies and it's really increasing. And uh, currently, it's a major health uh, uh, problem. Um, so, what I have been trying to understand is how violent people come about, what causes uh, violent behavior, so we can develop and implement preventive measures and efficient treatments. Some of the questions that I tried to answer, and I'm going to give them to you, what I found from my research, is are there critical periods where we should intervene? What should these prevention programs should include? And should we work with the children, with the caretakers, with the community? So one of the frequent questions among family and social environments it's how can we raise children with moral integrity? That means children who are honest, who, are, who have self-control, who have compassion, and who are fair, among other things. But those are the main things, I think. And um, especially, this is an important question because we are living in a morally ambiguous world where the ties between the family, the, society, the school, and the society are really weak. So, uh, some people suggest that we should just use, like, reinforce ethical behavior and just punish non-ethical behavior. And, but that's not enough. Like, scientific studies have found that if you just raise children by punish and, uh, and praise, they will end up just maybe not doing corrupted uh, behaviors, such as stealing or robbing, if there's a risk to be caught. Um, some of the people have suggested, why don't we teach values like compromise and honesty? Um, but values is not enough either. Like theoretical lessons of violence, of, 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 uh, of values is not enough. I have to share some studies, like uh, a, a, a thing that happened to me. I was interviewing this uh, uh, hit man who, without any remorse, he confessed, I kill more than 30 people. And I said, wow, did you rape them also? And he was really offended and said, how dare you? And I said, why not? He said, because I have values, doctor. So just theoretical lessons of values are not enough. So um, I wanted to know what happened in the brain of these people. The brain is a marvelous organ. It's just it just weighed three pounds, and it's the seeds of all human emotions, of love, of hate, of envy, and of all our intellectual and creative abilities. And it's interesting because Shakespeare, since the 17th cycle, as a century, he said that the brain is the sole fragile dwelling place. And what that he imply, that's a very thin line in between mental health and illness. So it's normal to feel sadness, but when these sad feelings are overwhelming, then you'd slide into depression. And the same happened with fear and phobias, and especially with aggression and violence. So aggression 
it's interesting because it's part of our human nature. It's, it's a biological trait that it was put into us so we can defend our territory and survive. Imagine the wolf, can, uh, a wolf who cannot defend its territory or its offspring. So the species will die. But nature didn't develop only aggression, but some traits that regulate aggression. So there's a balance, so the species will survive. But violence, violence is another stuff. It's aggression with intention of, make, of hurting somebody else, hurting physically or verbally somebody else. And that's abnormal. So um, it's interesting because in nature, you know, there are certain cues that inhibit aggression. So for example, if two wolves are fighting, the moment that one of the wolf the defeated wolf will release two drops of urine, that will be a sign so he won't be killed by the, by the one who's winning. Um, I have to, to tell you that not all cues uh, extend to all, all species. So if you pee or you wet your pants, that wouldn't work for you. That wouldn't work that if you are robbed or kill. So that's not the cue. So I've been trying to find out what are the cues that inhibit violence. So some of the cues that we have found, I'm going to show you, are related to emotion expression and emotional processing. So uh, as I mentioned before, I've been studying more than 370 violent people. I have a very special client in my uh, in my things. And one of them is like a woman serial killer. She's named Juana Barraza Samperio, who is named La Mata Vigita, because she uh, killed elderly women. She is accused of killing more than 18 women, 18 women and attempting to kill two others. And she has the longest sentence in the history of Mexico. She has 75, 56 years of prison. So uh, as, a, as a serial killer, you know, they have to have direct contact with the victim. They don't use guns, but they have to have direct contact. And she used ropes and uh, stalking. So she, here she's showing how she did, how she killed them. And this is the actual woman that she killed. How did he use these knots with stockings? Uh, so when I first interview her, I have to confess, people will say, weren't you scared? And I was like just close to her, and I was wondering, what are the cues that Tiger had killing instincts? So I said, oh, I'm, I put my Botox treatment last week, so maybe I'm safe. But, <laughs> but it really were not the wrinkles. The wrinkles were not the ones. She was abused by the mother verbally. Sometimes words hits more and hurts more than the real uh, physical aggression. And so what she was doing is killing her mother with each person that she killed. So we made lots of studies of, with all these samples that I have. And we want to do, we do magnetic res functional magnetic resonance uh, uh, while people, while these violent people are processing fear emotions. And also we do electrophysiological studies. So, and we also record how they process pleasant stimuli, unpleasant stimuli like motivated body, unpleasant stimuli with moral content, and neutral stimuli. And unless you have a fetish for floppy green towel, that's a neutral stimuli, okay? So we standardize those stimulus all over. And then, uh, so this is the recording where we make of her brain activity. And unlike the normal control, the, the unaggressive control, she didn't show any difference in the brain activity when he was watching those terrible stimuli. It was the same to see a chair than a mutilated, mutilated body. So also, we also find that uh, uh, there are certain structures in the brain there's a subcort subcortical structure that's called the amygdala um, that is really very important for fear processing. And that structure was smaller and not so activated with these fear, fear emotions. And the orbitofrontal cortex, which is related to decision making based on emotion, was also not activated as much as in the control sample. And the angular gyrus, which is an area that is related to intersensory integration, which is very important for reading and writing, is also not activated, and the connections. 
in the brain, the areas that produce emotions are not the same ones that uh, regulate emotions. So you, they have to be talking to each other. And these areas, like the connection, the uncinate fasciculus, which sounds very fancy, but the uncinate fasciculus is like thinner in those brains. So that uh, took us to see what's happening. Why is this brain organization coming up? Where does it come from? So we went and studied genetics. You don't have genet genes that for good behavior or bad behavior. What genes do is just regulate the exact amounts of the enzymes. They are very important for neurotransmitters. They are important for mood. So it's interesting because in the lab, you can create a killer mouse if just it just messed up with these chromosomes, with these genes. And that will happen also in the human being. If you have this gene, but this gene will only be activated if you have a history of child abuse, physically or verbally. So that takes us to another thing. Not, given that not everything is biology. So violent behavior, it's a mixture of uh, individual risk factor, of family risk factor, and of course of social risk factors. And what is happening? In Mexico, we're having a big problem. Like uh, the police is not giving, it's not providing uh, enough support and, and protection. So we have this in Tepito, that, that's a very high risk area. I'm working there. Um, and it said, advertencia, ratero a que agarremos en la madre de le daremos. I couldn't translate that into English because all my English friends don't say that bad word. So I translate it into, a thief we catch is a thief we smack, but it's really stronger than that. So children are raised with lots, lots of violence in their environment, hostility. And also, the problem is that the government is not putting uh, primary prevention programs. They just build more jails so they can put more people, and they are really repressing with violence the violent behavior. Also, that what's happening with the children is that children are raised by secondary caretakers, just like the TV, the internet, and you can have uh, videos of how to, do, how to do bullying through YouTube. So that in a brain that is information, that really desensitizes children for violence. So what is happening uh, is that uh, when we, should, we should develop primary programs for prevention of violence. And it's interesting because a Nobel Prize in economics, James Hackman, uh, he published these this, uh, measures that you should invest, that rates of return to capital investment that are much higher if the government invests in the preschool and school age than later. And that makes sense, because then you don't have dropouts, you don't have drug addiction, you don't have a teen pregnancy. And what did we find? My question, do you have me? Um, my question was, are there critical periods that we intervene? It's interesting. When I interview all these crime, criminals, offenders, they tell me there are three periods that are really important in their lives. First, they have, at three years old, they have several behavioral problems. At between five and seven, they don't learn to read and write, so they have school failure. And then at 11 and 13, they join gangs. And so then we are, have a big problem. And that's related to the structures that we find before. Like the amygdala at three years old, is to, uh, it's very important for fear. So when you want to, behave, to, 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 to train your children, you said, if you do that, I'm not going to love you anymore. You have fear of losing the love of your mother, or you have fear that you're going to put you in your room. But they don't care, because the amygdala is not working. And at five to seven, they have they, are, they don't learn to read, so they're a school failure. And then at 11, and that's related to the angular gyrus, that structure that I told you. And at 11 and 13, the frontal lobe, the orbital frontal cortex, which is, is related to decision taking based on emotions, is not working. So it really makes sense. So what we did is we started a preventive program five years ago in high poverty areas. And what we do is we work with the mothers, with the primary takers, we are usually the mothers and the grandmothers. And we teach them so they will be the teachers of the children and have to have self-control, working memory, 
and how to delay gratification. It's a huge program where they have to work with the children 20 minutes a day, and they are doing that, so they change their relationship with the child. And we work at the same time with the mothers. It's a two-hour, two-and-hour session where we work once a week during 25 sessions, and we teach them how to empower them. We teach them parenting styles. We teach them how to deal with frustration. So it's a very important program. And so the theory is that the, the, the mother in these early stages is like an external brain that really reg teach the child how to, to modify, to motor sensory integration, how to do integration sensory, and how to self-regulate. So um, it's important because Gradually, the child would get those information and he would use it by himself. So this is one of the mothers who was 10. He was really depressed. He was not well kept. She didn't watch herself. And look how pretty she came out when she ended up our, our program. So we are following those children. We, are, we finish up the, the second evaluation and we're seeing changes. So um, I think the only thing that would change the future of our children and to have adolescents who are honest, self-disciplined and committed is through education and emotional input on their raising. So usually when I ask people that you are, you are, why are you poor? Why do you have money? Because I, I don't have money, but really poverty is more than that. It's lack of knowledge and feeling helpless. And we think that just by giving education, you can have knowledge, you can give knowledge, so they will be empowered and that will be, and, and they will have the resources to get the money. So um, I think that moral integrity is really a step-by-step -step process that has to do with the individual who has the biology, and we really need to know more about the networks and how they connect. But these networks will be activated by family, and by the, the school and by the society. So it's really a gradual process where there has to be strong ties between what we teach in the house with what they teach the school. Sometimes in the school they teach them, oh, you should, you should cheat so we can win the football game. And what happened in the society is we have these leaders, really lots of corrupted leaders, that they are not an example for our children. So thank you very much.